Another group of insects we have to give some attention to are grasshoppers. Uh, this is a part of the country where grasshoppers are very abundant and we have many different kinds of grasshoppers and sometimes they can be quite damaging to crops. Although most grasshoppers we have are not. There's some 100 species that can be found in Colorado alone and only a very small number of these are going to be damaging to crops. Most of them just mind their own business. So for instance we have some interesting grasshoppers you wouldn't see in a garden. The biggest of the grasshoppers in this part of the region is the plains lubber or homesteader, sometimes called a, a very large grasshopper that's flightless you might see making little short jumps across a highway out in eastern Colorado. And it feeds on various broadleaf plants such as uh, um, common or wild sunflowers, but is never seriously damaging to any kind of crops and it's not a common insect that one would find in a garden ever. And some of them are quite unusual in their appearance. Uh, uh, the pictured grasshoppers, if anyone were to see those, always is a pretty uh, astonished that there can be grasshoppers that are so good looking and the great crest of grasshopper has a very uh, striking crest over the back. Both of these are species that again occur out in the plains and do not cause crop damage. They're feeding on various kinds of low-growing uh, uh, broadleaf plants that are native to the plains and uh, don't have much economic value to us. And, and there's even grasshoppers that feed on plants we don't like. Uh, there's a grasshopper that uh, specializes in the plant called snakeweed, which is considered a poisonous plant to livestock. And, and here's a grasshopper that, yes, it's eating plants, but it's eating a plant that many uh, uh, ranchers might consider a weed. Now, of the grasshoppers we have that we have issues with, uh, there's a small handful, um, and these five that are listed here, and I'll go show pictures of each, are pretty much it. These are, these are almost always the grasshopper that you would have in a, in a yard, garden, or, or field crop even. The uh, two-stripe grasshopper is perhaps the most common. It uh, is recognizable by having the, the two stripes along the back. This, this is Melanopus bivitatus. The red-legged grasshopper is one that is found a little more often in slightly moist environments, so it's a little more common to the east than it is here. Uh, Melanopus februm rubrum, it is not the only grasshopper with red legs, but it is one that is marked in that way. The differential grasshopper is also a common species in, in yards and gardens in the region. This is a fairly large grasshopper, it's not as large as the plains lubber, but a large grasshopper and it's characterized by those hind legs you can see in this picture that have uh, that we call herringbone pattern on the, the femur of those hind legs little cross markings of the black and another species common in crops and gardens could be the migratory grasshopper Melanopus sanguinopes. One uh, other grasshopper that's not in this genus Melanopus which these th four have been that is sometimes a problem is the clear wing grasshopper, Camnola pellucida. This is uh, a common outbreak species, particularly west of the Continental Divide. Now, the life history of grasshoppers is similar uh, in broad outline among all the species we have, the hundred odd species we have out here. Uh, they're going to have a single generation completed in every 12 month period. Uh, they are going to start as eggs that are laid in the ground. And they have the simple type of metamorphosis. So the eggs will hatch and become an immature form we call a nymph that feeds and molts and gets bigger, feeds and molts and gets bigger, and finally molts for the last time to an adult form that may have functional wings or sometimes they don't have wings in the adult stage, but are sexually mature in any case. Now the eggs of grasshoppers are going to be laid in the soil. In this case we happen to have the notorious desert locust of Africa doing it, but they grasshoppers here do the same thing where the female will insert her abdomen into the soil and lay eggs in the form of a pod. So here we see it diagrammatically. So, so eggs are going to be laid in these small pods uh, fairly shallowly in soil and they're usually very uh, particular about where they're going to lay these eggs. They have to be dry, undisturbed sites. Often the, it has to be the right uh, uh, soil texture and maybe aspect, drainage and the like. Uh, in some places, they may uh, there may be grasshoppers of many different uh, 
kinds and uh, laying eggs in a very small area. There might be an egg bed or multiple individuals in a small area of the same species. So egg pods you might encounter were you to till up the garden. Uh, they're certainly visible. Uh, we get a an egg pod exposed next to a nickel in the lower right picture uh, and again they might include two to four dozen eggs and each grasshopper is capable of laying multiple egg pods. The eggs will hatch and you'll have nymphs and in this case uh, uh, we've got nymphs of, of various stages uh, as they get older they are bigger and you might see the development of uh, little pads, the uh, wing pads that will get larger and larger and then be fully functional or, or mature wings at the last molt. Uh, in the picture on the upper left it does show a grasshopper next to the old skin from which it molted. Uh, you will rarely see the skins of grasshoppers because usually they turn around and chew them, chew them up after they have molted. Now when does all this occur? If we, if we talk about a typical grasshopper uh, they will have a one-year life cycle that starts as an egg coming into the new year, the eggs being laid in late summer or fall. Uh, these will then hatch at some time in late spring, May or June, uh, and the uh, nymphs will be present in, in late spring and early summer. You'll start seeing adults in mid to late summer, and th this time the eggs will be laid for the next season, and that's typical, and that's the kind of life cycle we have of all the pest species that we have in yards and gardens, where the overwintering stage will be the eggs, and the eggs will hatch in uh, late spring, often uh, mid-May or so, sometimes into June, and adults will be laying eggs late in the summer. But we have many different kinds of grasshoppers, and the uh, life cycle can be shifted. So this uh, shows a, a diagram of, of s seven species of grasshoppers that we have and, and when their eggs hatch. And we can see that uh, in this diagram most of the ones that are shown here uh, the eggs are going to hatch in May and June which is typical. But notice the one on the, on the far uh, right in the lower right uh, eutectic simplex. This is one that eggs hatch in, in August. And this is an insect uh, that doesn't overwinter as eggs it overwinters as a nymph and then matures to an adult. So not all grasshoppers spend the winter in the in the egg stage. So there are some grasshoppers you can see out and about in the middle of winter. Uh, these are four species that, that uh, are ones that don't overwinter as eggs. So sometimes it, it, it surprises people to be out on a walk in February and it's a warm day, uh, maybe 50, 60, and, and grasshoppers are out and people may think, oh my goodness, they're already out. It's going to be a terrible grasshopper year. Well, no, it doesn't mean anything about how bad it will be for grasshoppers that year. There's always some species of grasshoppers that are out in the winter, just not the ones that we have uh, as a pest species. So the grasshoppers you see during the winter will not be the ones that you'll have as a problem later in the garden. They'll be pretty much done before the crops are up and they're usually feeding on plants that we don't care care much about out in, out in grassland. So here's a here's a common spring species that is uh, laying its eggs in August. It's a nymph throughout the winter, matures in uh, in spring the following year, and there again are several species like that as well. So what do we do about grasshoppers or what controls grasshoppers? Uh, this is a, these are very difficult insects to, to manage ourselves uh, in large part because they're so highly mobile. Uh, there are very few insects that uh, approach their uh, mobility uh, and make control difficult as a result. Flea beetles would be an example. Uh, but there are things that do keep their populations in some sort of uh, uh, check, uh, either naturally or some, some things we can apply as well. So grasshopper populations go up, they go down, they always have, and a lot of this is due to natural controls, natural controls which can include weather. So the temperature and rainfall aspects of weather can be particularly important um, in terms of uh, how, how grasshoppers will survive, but it's, it's a little complicated. Uh, rainfall in particular is important, and rain, when it rains is, is particularly important in terms of how it will affect 
the ability of grasshoppers to develop well or not. So, so for example, if we just take rainfall, um, one of the most important things in the survival of grasshoppers is that there is some very te young, tender, fresh growth available to them when they hatch from those eggs, say in May or June. So if there has been a moisture event and you had good spring weather with moisture, uh, then you'll have lots of green material. So that's taken care of. So there'll be something green and the, the young, if they hatch, uh, from that we'll then have something to, to feed on. On the other hand, if we have a very dry period and a very droughty spring, the grasses and other plants are, are maybe not even germinating or they're very tough and the grasshoppers, even if they hatch from the eggs, will not be able to thrive and probably not even survive to the next stage. On the other hand, if it rains and there's good moisture conditions after uh, this egg hatch event, then that can have some of deleterious effects on grasshoppers. It can uh, heavy rainfall events can be pretty damaging to very young grasshoppers. It also can assist in the spread of some of the diseases we'll talk about. And furthermore, it, it just also uh, helps mitigate the effects of grasshoppers. Uh, if we have good rainfall events, then there's lots of food on which grasshoppers can feed, and they may not be bothering bothering us. As a result, they're staying somewhere else off the crop uh, site along the roadsides or out on the prairie. There are a number of natural predators. Some are vertebrates, some are insects, and some of these are, are kind of interesting. Uh, so uh, if we were to look at some of the things that are feeding on grasshoppers out on the prairie, uh, one of the more striking groups of insect predators are robber flies. Uh, these are long-bodied, fairly large flies that pretty much rule the airwaves uh, in uh, large areas of the state catching anything that jumps or flies uh, that, that passes by. They grab them and have a, a piercing mouth part that rapidly incapacitates them. So robber flies are taking out some. And then there's a curious kind of beetle uh, that also is quite important. And this has some, this, these are blister beetles. And blister beetles are, are interesting in a couple respects. Uh, we may sometimes see the adults feeding on pollen of plants or occasionally chewing on the leaves and flowers of plants. But blister beetles, uh, at least the most common kinds of blister beetles, develop as a predator of a pod of eggs. So in this picture we see an adult blister beetle. In the lower left we see a larval blister beetle. And that larva of the blister beetle is feeding on a pod of grasshopper eggs. So where you just see a, a blister beetle, uh, there'd be one blister beetle, but maybe two dozen or three dozen fewer grasshoppers as a result of that insect. So populations of blister beetles we often see kind of uh, working in cycles following outbreaks of grasshoppers. You should see a lot of blister beetles the, the year following a lot of grasshoppers. There are some unusual diseases, some of which we've discussed earlier. There's that uh, fungus that kills grasshoppers where it causes them to, to, to climb and, and then die stiff and stuck to the uh, top of a plant and then the fungi, uh, will, uh, the spores of the fungus will emerge and then perhaps infect other grasshoppers. A spectacular disease, not all that common, and conditions have to be just right for the epizootics to kick in. And then there's that strange nematode, these uh, uh, Mermis nigrosins, the largest nematode we have, several inches long, coming out in, in a cool, wet morning, laying its eggs, which are illustrated in the upper right picture on on leaves and were a grasshopper to feed on that leaf, then the eggs would hatch and successfully develop within the grasshopper. Uh, the Mermis nigrosins, the grasshopper nematode, will, will ultimately uh, uh, kill and uh, before that uh, sterilize the insect. Uh, pretty, pretty spectacular kind of uh, uh, parasite. And in this case there are multiple ones that have come out of this differential grasshopper here. Birds important part of the diet of many of our native birds, uh, particularly on the prairie, are the are grasshoppers. Uh, so the lark bunting, our state bird, uh, kestrels will feed on them. A great many birds feed on grasshoppers and even big things do. Grasshoppers are, are one of the many things that a coyote will, will feed on. So in, in this picture right here, uh, in the lower right, here's a, uh, a, a 
bit of uh, coyote scat that I, I've collected. And as you can see, this is it looks to be pretty much 100% grasshopper parts, probably from that differential grasshopper because the herringbone pattern you can see on, in some of those uh, fragments there uh, that are from the, the leg of the, the grasshopper. So if we were to try to do some grasshopper control, uh, again, this is a difficult problem because of the mobility of the insects. These, these can move extensively. The primary strategy for grasshopper control is to treat sites where the grasshopper eggs hatch and early stages develop, the, the breeding sites, before they are moving into croplands and gardens. Because often the early stages, they are in one spot and then they will disperse and then move to a wide number of other spots. So when they're in a relatively confined area and they are young, grasshoppers are optimally managed. So we go after the breeding sites. So what are the breeding sites? They are areas that are dry and undisturbed. Now if we have croplands where we have cultivated fields, grasshopper eggs are destroyed by cultivation. So the eggs that would be laid and would survive would be in the undisturbed habitat along the edge of the field uh, or along roadside ditches. That would be a site where grasshoppers uh, may successfully lay their eggs. In a more urbanized site, uh, it is often not in an irrigated yard because it's too moist, although areas in a, in a zero escape planting might uh, be suitable for grasshoppers. But it, it might be the lot, the empty lot that's near, nearby where, again, it's dry and undisturbed. So in this picture, the, the house on the left may not have much overwintered egg production or, or uh, survival of eggs there, but uh, the field on the right is where they are surviving. And then when the adults are out and about, they may then move into the yard to the left. And then if you're trying to... Uh, um, grow a garden and you're out in an area where there's uh, a large area of grasshopper habitat, it becomes uh, much more difficult. So in this case, this isolated house uh, surrounded by prairie where a large number of grasshoppers could be successfully laying eggs and the eggs surviving that would then produce stages that could easily jump that fence. Now, for grasshopper controls, we go after those young stages. We try to figure out where they are and the, the uh, best way to do this is to do a survey when you expect them to have hatched. Uh, so that might be mid-May, early June. And if you find an area that has large numbers of nymphs, that would be the area of targeting. Then if you, you do want to attempt control of those, you, we will use sprays or we will use baits. And I'm not going to go into details of all this, but there is a fact sheet that the Canvas site will link you to that talks about the ways we could manage grasshoppers in a garden or small acreage setting. Do want to mention though that uh, we have uh, different ways we can apply these and different kinds of products we can use. Uh, sprays are used but baits are sometimes used for grasshoppers and a, and a bait is a, a way to formulate an insecticide that can have advantages. Uh, usually baits are a dry formula a formulation. Um, they include some sort of material on which a grasshopper in this case would feed uh, and a small amount of insecticide associated with it. It might be bran or molasses or apple pumice or something like that with a small amount of some insecticide and it might have the appearance say of grape nuts or something like that and it would be augered out with a little fertilizer spreader or something like something similar and grasshoppers would feed on the bait pellets and and, and the advantage of having a bait is not only can they be effective, but they are also a way to use an insecticide that can spare adverse effects on other insects. So if you spray something and lots of insects may be visiting the, the leaves or flowers if there's flowers in place. So you might be killing a beneficial species such as predators or maybe some pollinators. Baits largely spare them uh, because of the way that they're formulated and are pretty much only going to be eaten by an insect that chews and is attracted to, the, to that kind of bait.
So the primary baits that are used uh, would again be some kind of bran material, often with some sugar or molasses associated with it, and a small amount of insecticide. These are pretty difficult to get uh, in in most garden centers and the like, although some co-ops carry it. Uh, it may have to be something that is ordered through a local co-op if, if you have an incipient grasshopper outbreak. And then there are um, some baits that involve a, a microorganism that can be used to help control grasshoppers called Nosema locusti. And this is a, a type of naturally occurring uh, pathogen, a microsporidian pathogen, that affects certain kinds of grasshoppers. And, and that's all it affects. Uh, there are two uh, people, uh, two outfits that are in the business of creating Nosema locusti baits. One is goes under the trade name Semispore, and the other is Nolo bait. And uh, this is a, uh, a a kind of a, a disease that is uh, specific to grasshoppers. Here are some two uh, old packages of d different formulations, grasshopper spore or hopper stopper. I always like the one on the right, the hopper stopper, because you can see the, the uh, little grieving uh, grasshopper widow, apparently, uh, in that picture. I don't think most people grieve for grasshoppers too bad, too much uh, when uh, they've been uh, ripping up your garden. The Nolo bait or the semispore is uh, much more effective against young stages of grasshoppers. It is a kind of disease that produces a debilitating condition in affected insects. It doesn't rapidly kill them and it uh, often causes them to die during periods of stress like a molt. So it's applied against young stages. It's not going to be effective against adults. And then other things could be used. I mean, people can use poultry, and uh, people do use poultry for, for control of this. Uh, gra chickens love grasshoppers. Uh, and you have to have a way to use chickens so they're not just uh, ripping everything else up, but um, if uh, uh, you can manage them in some way, fence them off from areas where they might be doing too much damage. They'll take any grasshopper that they can they can reach. And uh, turkeys or guinea hen, these are all things that uh, uh, you might uh, find uh, useful for grasshoppers. And by the way, if you uh, if you keep poultry and you happen to have grasshoppers, you might want to get an insect net. Uh, and an insect net, uh, insect sweep net, uh, you could go out to the field and you could sweep up a whole bunch of grasshoppers, dump them in front of your chickens, and they will have a blast. Uh, they'll just watch it. It's, it's worth the price of a sweep net if you're keeping chickens. Of course, if you got poultry, you don't want to have coyotes, so those two things are obviously incompatible. But uh, if you've got poultry, you know how to uh, keep this under control here. Some other things, just a couple of pictures here. Here's a, here's a, another predator, a little cat, checking out a grasshopper there on the on the uh, trunk of that tree, and uh, there. And gardeners will also uh, sometimes go after grasshoppers one at a time. It can, it, grasshoppers can be extremely annoying and difficult to control in some areas. So here's a here's a, a master gardener who's going after a grasshopper right here. Getting another one. Anyway, a little time consuming here, but uh, certainly uh, probably satisfying, quite satisfying. Of course, uh, go a little further south where everything's bigger, you might go hunt them. This is, of course, not a true picture. <laughs> this is, uh, even in Texas, the grasshoppers don't get any bigger than the ones in Colorado. Or in some places you can eat them. Uh, here's uh, uh, grasshoppers for sale in a market in southern Mexico and Oaxaca. Uh, Chapolinas they're called and uh, certain species is particularly tasty and here I am eating it myself. Uh, fine appetizers served with guacamole. So that's pretty much it for managing grasshoppers but I, I do want to bring up one other thing that I think is quite important uh, or, or certainly interesting. I mean gr with grasshoppers as bad as they ever are, and you're going to have a problem with them, this is one insect that actually used to be worse. And, and there's an interesting story behind this. It involves an insect called the Rocky Mountain Locust. And uh, it's another member of the genus Melanopolis, uh, the Rocky Mountain Locust, but I did not mention it because it's not here anymore. 
This is an insect that during a uh, period in the late 1800s, and particularly the 1870s, was observed to occur in fantastic number, and it, it, it became a uh, species that migrated in enormous bands over broad areas of the western United States. Now this has been going on for millennia probably, but uh, was, was first observed uh, and recorded during the 1870s. And during that time, uh, there were areas where uh, these grasshoppers would become so abundant that they would uh, uh, darken the sky, like perhaps you've seen pictures of, of the locusts that occur in Africa and other parts of the world to, to this date. Uh, but this Rocky Mountain locust was one that in the mid-1870s in particular was spectacular. And it's, it's the species, the Rocky Mountain locust, Melanopolis sprechus. Um, as an example of, of how abundant they were, there was a, a single swarm that was observed in 1875 that was crossing over the Panhandle part of Nebraska that was estimated to cover 198,000 square miles and include 12.5 trillion insects. Uh, this is roughly the the area that would include Connecticut, Delaware, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Vermont. A single swarm took several days to pass over, recorded uh, in 1875. And this is downtown Colorado Springs in 1875. And uh, the picture is a, a little hard to see, and obviously it's a fairly old picture, but this is just grasshoppers just covering everything. And the headline in this uh, picture here, Grasshopper Plague in 75 started water system. That's because there were so many grasshoppers that had invaded Colorado Springs that they fouled the wells. They fell in the wells and, and rotted and fouled the wells. So here's a report just to, to show how amazing uh, these were. This is a report uh, from 1875, early August. Uh, reported here uh, in the Gearing Citizen from a newspaper account uh, 2013. Uh, the locust also invaded parts of Colorado. Mr. H. McAllister, Colorado Springs, recorded his own observations. In 1875, early in August, a storm sudden, sw suddenly came down. The insects came with the wind and alighted in a rain. The ground was literally covered two and three inches deep and glittered as a new dollar with the active multitude. In alighting, they circle in myriads about you, beating against everything animate and inan or inanimate, driving in into open doors and windows, heaping about your feet and around your buildings, their jaws constantly at work, biting and testing all things and seeking what they can devour. The noise their myriad jaws make when engaged in their work of destruction can be realized by anyone who has fought a prairie fire or heard the flames passing along before a brisk wind, the low crackling and rasping. The general effect of the two sounds is very much the same. So this is an outbreak of the Rocky Mountain locust that occurred in Colorado in 1875. And, and this was a disaster. Uh, large areas of the high plains were uh, were, were facing starvation because these grasshoppers were so effectively uh, destroying crops that uh, th it was a national disaster and, and actually spurred Congress to action to hire the first scientist ever the U.S. government put in to uh, employment, uh, C.V. Riley, to become chairman of the Grasshopper Commission to find a, uh, a way to help uh, manage this problem. And he did an excellent series of studies on this. Uh, and uh, what was interesting was that uh, the problem started to go away on its own. So in 1875, 1874, 1876, outbreak after outbreak in various areas of, of the uh, high plains, western U.S. and parts of Canada. And then they started going down. And then there were some outbreaks in the 1880s, but, but they're smaller. And then a few outbreaks in the 1890s, very small, but still present. And then in 1902, this insect was caught for the last time ever. It was in Alberta. So in 1870s, this is an insect that darkened the skies across the western United States. And in 1902, it was last caught, and it is extinct. <laughs> 
This is an insect that's extinct now for over 110 years, and it is the only pest insect in the history of the planet that we have managed to make go to extinction. And we didn't even try. Uh, we did something to cause the Rocky Mountain locust to become extinct, but it certainly wasn't through any major effort humans did. It may have been incidental to uh, eliminating the buffalo or in overgrazing or something else at the time, but regardless, it uh, is a pretty striking uh, insect example of, of uh, something that was uh, once very common and, and is now less common, in this case completely extinct. Why? Anyway, the mystery of the Rocky Mountain locust is, uh, is one of the great entomological mysteries of the United States. Now, there are still people who will remember back in the 1930s that there were outbreaks then. Uh, there was big grasshopper outbreaks. Took out over 11 million acres a year uh, during the early 1930s or late 1930s, 1937, 1938. And this was a different insect. This was a, a grasshopper we call the High Plains grasshopper. And during the Dust Bowl years, this one exploded and migrated large distances, maybe 20 miles a day, and also did the kind of damage that earlier the Rocky Mountain locust did. However, the High Plains grasshopper has reverted to uh, become a non-pest. Uh, we don't see it. It hasn't, ha there hasn't been an outbreak of that since the Dust Bowl periods of the 1930s. So we have two very interesting grasshoppers that have occurred in this part of the country that are not presently an issue. One of them, the Rocky Mountain locust, was formerly incredibly abundant and is now extinct. It doesn't exist. And the other, the High Plains grasshopper, uh, has not had an outbreak since 1930s. We don't know what occurred during the 1930s to trigger the outbreak, but uh, regardless, it is now reverted to a minor status and is one of the f grasshoppers that's fairly difficult to find in many areas. So that kind of summarizes some of the things with grasshoppers, a pretty complex group of insects. Sometimes we can do uh, some things to help manage them, uh, but they 